Hello, welcome to the Talent Development Show. Today we want to talk about route setting for coaches. And we also want to talk about what the difference is between route setting for coaches uh, compared to real route setters. Because uh, I, I couldn't, if you take me as an example, I couldn't be a real route setter and, and set, uh, I think, a would be hard for me to really pinpoint even USB problems in terms of difficulty. So this is what we want to talk about today. Well, you got to give yourself a little bit more credit because uh, we chatted about this before, but you posted that video of Instagram and I don't know if that's the earliest skate on record, but it, it's pretty early. <laughs> yeah. Somebody said yeah, proto skate and, style. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And it's also something I, I, I think maybe we don't talk about uh, uh, enough is uh, the whole politics about uh, uh, being a climbing coach. You now that there, there's some politics involved. And in this case, like my, my recent Instagram post was also a matter of the German Alpine Club. And I deliberately put like one view of the box with the holes that the German Alpine Club provided at this time. Uh, now to, is it a little bit of inside uh, tongue in cheek or inside a joke if it wouldn't be so sad because when we opened the box we just we, we didn't know if we would, should laugh or cry you know and even this this shape of the wall where I put the uh, skate move in this is just a terrible shape. You no, know, you can't do a whole lot with. So, uh, and it had been all done at this point. I, this video is from 2002, and there was only these really awkward kind of uh, very unsatisfying too. You know, like you were either uh, slipping or so. The, the shape uh, doesn't didn't lend itself for for uh, for setting. So, why I'm saying the politics is uh, uh, our officials, of course, didn't want to hear it. You know, if we, uh, regardless if the coaches or the setters or so, they didn't want to hear it. They spent the money on the wall. They didn't ask anybody uh, in the know how, uh, you know, uh, how to design a wall. And it took us, uh, us uh, yes, us, because uh, eventually the uh, Robert Leisner, the guy who runs Mandala in Dresden, after a lot of fighting, was allowed to uh, design the uh, Munich wall. And this was a huge struggle, you know, and the same with the, for the road, uh, road setters, you know, and even like for, for myself, when, when I coach the Germans, like you want to have a certain style at your camp. But of course, this might be uh, like some, some foreign road setter, you know, you might, maybe you want to have like French slab climbing skills, you know, or Japanese uh, uh, karate uh, style, you know, but this guy will be more expensive than your local setters. And also most federations don't have the capacity to provide enough jobs for, for the uh, setters, you know, so there's a huge fight for every job. And then, of course, you're asked why uh, you're not taking so-and-so, you know, he's a good road setter and he is no 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 question about it but he can't set this particular uh, uh style you know so i i, I think that's a, a fact of of being a climbing coach or actually being any coach that gets often you know we all we tend to think of the glamorous sides of it but uh, the, the politics are a huge part of it uh, and then we are not even talking about the athletes who don't do well <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have to, I feel like that's almost going to encompass a whole show on its own of like your yeah. history of, of route setting. And, um, but I think that post is really cool. And maybe if you haven't seen it, you should go and check it out. It's, it's a really strange kind of thing that we're going to talk about because I, I, a lot of times like coaching and route setting, it depends on the U.S. I think it's getting molded more into one. And for me, I started as a route setter first and then became a coach and I'm definitely more of a coach now. Uh, but they're two very intertwined for me. Uh, but they're also very separate career paths in some way. It's, and a lot of times you do have route setters who aren't necessarily coaches at all, who are basically the test makers that are making, you know, that are setting for these competitions. So I think it's just 
an interesting discussion. No, I, want, I want, just wanted to add now where the route setting belongs. Like if you remember my confusing mind maps, it would belong into the constraints led approach. It's part of the constraints led approach because this is what a, a, a setting coach uh, uh, does. He uh, manipulates uh, constraints. No, actually, every setter manipulates uh, constraints. I think when we talked about the constraints that approach initially, we kind of act, you know, we're thinking about like uh, the volumes as an example, and it was something almost just like an environment that we were creating. But really, setting is the constraints that approach right from the beginning. And I think it's really important for us to highlight that. Basically, the, the stuff, stuff that's, that's on the wall, wall, the approach that athletes take to competition climbing, they have a certain amount of time to solve an issue that may be basically a, a problem that they haven't had the opportunity to do before. And the game itself is like a constraints led approach. And so having control over what the athletes have to practice on is really like the fundamental part of that. Let me let me just get this back on. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so okay. Okay. Constraints led approach. So it would be. Uh, uh, the, the environment and the task that you are manipulating in, in when you are setting. Yeah, yeah so, so kind, kind of going, going back, back to this, it's a, a, we, we made, made I, I think with the examples we had initially, maybe we were almost overcomplicating it in terms of thinking like, these, these are all the things, things that you could do outside of climbing, but really just like the setting, the, the boulder problems to begin with, there's just so many different types of movements and things that you can challenge your athletes with that by making the decisions on what to put them on, you only have so many hours of the day that they can be climbing on something and you want it to be the things that are going to test them the best. And, and that's a decision that you're making as a coach constantly. And I, I think the reason we want, want to talk about route setting, um, the reason we want to talk about right route setting in this context is because uh, some people are very hands off of that as coaches. They just have basically what's available to them in the gym and they don't have as much input necessarily over what their athletes are climbing on. They're just basically telling them what, what like a you go do these boulder problems. But ideally you have a lot more control over that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 I don't know if this is their choice to be hands off uh, necessarily. They're just not allowed to change in, anything. And okay, the question is, I think we mentioned this before. Um, you you have to try to stay as true as possible to your original uh, thought of what the athletes need to work on. And every time they don't do this, you know, like if every time they 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 find some cheat or so, that's that's a that's cool that they're doing this. But uh, you, if you are not allowed to to reset or set yourself, you have to ask them, okay, just don't use this part of the wall, you know, or just don't match. Or, uh, you know, uh, and of course, you need a somehow close relationship with your athletes, you know, because it's not, uh, they, they, they might argue, you know, depending on how mature the, the athletes are, that might be a problem. But I think you can get there. You no, know? uh, uh, and uh, I, again, I think the best way is to, the, the athletes, if they find the problem boring, they are very open to making it more exciting again. And this is why when, when we were before World Cups, for example, we were, and, and this is true for all the teams that are traveling, you know, there are very few destinations where you have ideal boulder gyms that have the necessary hard problems. Actually, there are very few people, uh, places in the world, you know, but if you, something is in Salt Lake, you'll be very uh, have, lucky. Something is in Paris and in, in Munich, you, that, that all works, but it doesn't work in Shanghai. You know, there's no World Cup problem in, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but in Pogo, Shanghai, I mean, they, they just don't have the, the audience for, for putting up uh, World Cup problems, you know. Of course, if you're in Okikubo, uh, Okikubo is all there, you know, as a coach, you almost don't have to do, there's no work for you uh, uh, there. But uh, the reality is you have like consumer oriented, very pleasant, unfrustrating route setting. And how do you make it a little bit more realistic? Uh, yeah, I would say, okay, so I think that goes into almost like what I think a key difference is between uh, 
maybe a route setter coach versus a route setter that's like a, for in a commercial setting. Um, I don't really care if the athletes like the boulder that I set for them. And I think that's something that, that I think was a little different. Like I almost have, when I was setting, you know, as a head route setter, for me, it was a little bit about, okay, we have to take in consideration, like, you know, it, a commercial part aspect of the, of the business. Like we want to make sure that the people have a chance to succeed. You know, you want to have the right level of frustrated frustration. You don't want them to be so frustrated that they don't ever want to come back. And for the stuff that I set for, for the athletes, it's like the complete opposite, you know? And, uh, I'll, I want to get, I don't really care as long as I'm testing the things that I'm looking for. I don't really care if they really love the Boulder problem or don't. And, and it's funny cause like they don't really see it that way. Anyway, they, they start to expand a lot, quite a bit of what they like in climbing. That is what I mean. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, usually when, when you work closely with your athletes, that's not an argument you, you're having that they're almost happy if you find something that, uh, that is just difficult to do that challenges them. Definitely. Yeah. I'm just uh, uh, wondering if you're watching this and you, you're not really sure of what we talk about, like in terms of commercial setting and uh, and um, uh, like what, what the difference is, you know, and uh, like uh, tops, like frustrating is when you when it's very difficult to uh, when when the problem comes without a prescription. You know, when, when it's really difficult to figure it out, and even um, uh, you went to the zone once, but it was so subtle what you did that you can't remember it. You know, like the, what, what happened to Orian on the last problem? Was it in Meiringen, I think? You know, like she, she went through the, uh, uh, and she fell uh, pretty much at the top, and she had till two minutes on the, on the clock, and then she couldn't do the start anymore. You know, uh, uh, this, this would be most likely not a, a, a typical commercial problem. It, a commercial problem would be, yeah, sim not as complex. And especially, I'm almost saying not as subtle. I mean, these, these problems are, in, in my mind, they are, they're very subtle. Yeah, yeah, and I think also, like, like you said, the insecurity of it, you know, the feeling that, oh, at some, you know, I could be, if I slide out of here, I'm gonna scrape my shins, you know uh the, the tweakiness like i think generally most of these co problems will will be considered tweaky uh they they might just you know ask you to hold things in ways but as a route setter that's like a way to to get fall discomfort is a really effective way to get falls if you can get the athlete thinking that they're doing something wrong uh and that's really all it is it's just that they feel uncomfortable like i mean a really weird mantle press that yeah. the, you can get yeah. an athlete that decides I don't really like how this feels. I'm going to come down and figure out because yeah. it seems wrong versus the athlete that's like, yeah. this is just, this, I'm going to live and sit in this for a little yeah. bit longer. And Let's make one thing clear that we, we're not talking about like funky uh, boulder problems right now. You know, maybe it comes across like this, but there's one thing like uh, there is a term for what uh, uh, Al just described uh, or what, what it leads to, you know, this feeling un of uncomfortable leads to decision fatigue. And it was a, a while ago, it was talked about how, how Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs, how they every day they're wearing the same clothes. So they only have this uh, black turtleneck. So there's one decision less they have to uh, uh, to take. I don't know how much this takes away from your <laughs> how important this is in your life to <laughs> to always have to choose a black turtleneck. But if you think about it, like every time a root setter succeeds in making you wonder if this is the right way to hold a hold, you know, he adds up to this. Uh, you now every decision you make fatigues you you know makes you a little bit tired you know and if you and this adds up if you do this 40 times on 40 moves at the end at the 38th move you're 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 fried you know your brain is fried and and this decision fatigue in lead climbing is very very important you know it's a big part of it every time you're like ah oh, no fantastic you know you got a little bit more tired and a little bit less secure yeah, and I think that's why that's the problem with like the real problem with rest, restful positions isn't so much necessarily that the athletes get to recover physically. It's a lot of times that they get to recover mentally, 
Uh, totally. And the fact that they went from just having to quickly make decisions to all of a sudden, okay, I'm going to sit here and reset my brain a little bit. And this happens in bouldering as well. Yeah, and if you want to uh, want to look it up, you know, if you're wondering what we're talking about, just watch any competition and observe when at what hand they're chalking. And you see like 70% of nonsensical chalking maneuvers. And this is just to give your brain a reset, you know, and also to be in charge, you know, because the act of chalking is something you can, is within your control. So it gives you an island of stability and security in the uncertain world you know but very very often that that is uh, like even on the slab and you cannot really use your hands you know but still you need to chalk <laughs> you know and this is I, I think that's a good first indicator that the setters succeeded you know in the, they're making you want to control something in this situation and that's already as a root setter you go check you know <laughs> You succeeded. I think we should, uh, or this is probably going to be a good topic for us in the future, but I, in general, I mean, that's also adds up, not just for the competition, but you know, if, if in the morning you're thinking, well, what, what do I want to eat for, for breakfast? Like you said, what am I wearing? You know, what is my warm up like if it's always like completely different? And if your entire competition every day that you're, what am I going to eat for dinner? Uh, like having all those things that you have to make decisions on it's understated that if the setting is correct and you're actually asking athletes to make, you know, then another like 30 decisions or more during a competition, uh, it's going to be, you're just fried third, third day on or something. You're just, you're done. Yeah. And you can see that in some athletes, you're like, they don't look the same as, as they did. And it's, yeah, it's cause they're just mentally over it. In the... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, let me give you another uh, example. I'm leave a comment below if we uh, miss or if i misjudge you you know and uh, uh, maybe i should think more highly of you but sometimes i'm a little bit afraid that uh, we're talking about two abstract and too lofty uh, concepts uh, I'll just give you uh, one other example what i meant with a prescription like uh, uh, the old holes the holes we had in munich 20 years ago you know they they basically they have one way of holding them and this is it and uh, now you replace these holes to just flat round holes, you know, that can be held as a side cling, as an under cling, you know, basically that. And this will already lead to decision fatigue. And this is not something that is true for like youth A or B. If you look back into lead finals in, in Arco in 2018, basically all the work that Christian Bindhammer, a German a really good uh, route setter who mainly does lead, but he's really good in this. He just offers a lot of, uh, okay, I can do it this way, I can do it this way, and uh, do it this way. And this way he succeeds with putting actually not very difficult routes on the wall. I mean, of course, they're World Cup, yeah, they're very difficult. But the, the, the single moves are really not difficult, but just this, and you can tell, like, if you look at the female finals, you know, there's a green hole at, at the beginning, and there are all these round holes, and you see some World Club athletes being really troubled by all the uh, ambiguity of these holes. And Christian was sitting with the, there watching this with a big smile. So I want to highlight that what we're talking about right now is essentially like very for you having been doing this for a long time. And for me, not quite as long as you, obviously, uh, we start to develop ideas of what route setting, because every time, essentially, even at practice, anytime an athlete finishes a boulder problem, it's a little bit of validation to some strategy that they took on it right yeah so yeah. anytime they get a finish it's like a reward for decisions that they made and the thing is you can be rewarding the wrong things uh, and that has to do with the setting so you, you could you could essentially like if if an athlete's really tall and they reach through and grab a really down pulling hold and go to the finish they got a little reward just now for doing something that might not work in the future. And that's okay in that, in that aspect. But if that continues to be a habit, um, then, you know, that could essentially create bad habits that are going to be harder to break later on. Yeah. So yeah. I've created a little bit of, this is kind of just my thing that I usually use or things that I think about. And this is not a, a complete list by any means, but 
Um, essentially, these are right now things that I, some of the things that I look for in a boulder right now that are, are not necessarily, this is not to say uh, that this is the right thing to, that a boulder should have, but when I'm setting things for the athletes to test them, these are like things that I think are going to reward them in ways that are going to set them up for success, you know? And yeah. it's not the only stuff they're climbing on, but a lot of times I feel like the gym might not necessarily, this is not represented. So I need to make sure that they have opportunities to be tested on this and rewarded for it. So I wrote rewards, good positions and good trajectories. Uh, and this goes back to the constraints that approaches is just essentially it, you control the affordances to the athlete. So the athlete has to learn how to search for the right positions first, not necessarily beta, which is kind of what you were talking about just now. Even just if the hold, even just by making the hold ambiguous enough to where you're not exactly sure how you approach it or with what hand or how you would even hold it, that's, you know, that goes into that. And then also learn to generate momentum from center of mass first. So we had we had that uh, video that we shared in Maring In where we said, um, that kind of dyno at finals where we said, oh, if that, if that hold was less in cut, you know, they wouldn't be able to approach it. Maybe Orion wouldn't be able to double jump to it with both hands. So that's kind of what we're talking about in this sense. It's like, uh, yeah. you know, I want to make sure that there's one way to approach the hold where if you approach it from like, it, you, we can all imagine if that's just a giant jug, they can jump at it 15 different ways from di like from all sorts of different angles and they're able to basically control the swing. So, yeah. and similarly- What I find that actually like what for resonates the most with me is the indecision has to be punished <laughs> or sh should be punished with a, a proximal to distal, you know, you, I, with a center moving from the center of mass. I, I think for me, this is a, a really big uh, uh, issue and uh, um, if, if you don't mind, I don't know if you wanted to talk about other uh, issues beforehand, but uh, when I look at the, at your list, I, I, this resonates the most. And uh, I think that's for many climbers, that's almost the biggest crux, especially if you, uh, and this is also where you where you're punished the most from bad coaching in your past. You know, because and uh, uh, probably also the hardest to do, and also uh, creates the most arguments with your your athletes. You know, and this is actually when uh, when I was talking about that uh, when when I was coaching the German team that uh, we were looking for particular setters in 2016 when Tomoa became so dominant and showed all these uh, styles. He did this uh, a slap in Munich, and he was the only one, only Manu Cornu touched the, the top hold, but fell then. And I asked in Germany, who can set something like this? And it was only uh, Robert Leisner, the guy who actually set the Munich uh, slap, and another guy who was not available for our next camp. And um, these things, what we are talking about is basically where you cannot really apply force to the hold. You know, it has, you have to move from the hip. Or, or proximal, if you want to use a fancy term, you know, you, you, from your center, or as Al says, uh, uh, from your center of mass. And I, I think that's the most uh, important, like in terms of movement skills, this is the most important skill, you know, and this is actually where, uh, where every coach should take notice. The, the, the problem with this, with setting something like this is as soon as a stronger athlete can apply force on the holds and can move from there you know like, like distally from uh, from your fingers to the hip like a traditional climbing move you uh, uh, what, what you just mentioned you reinforce this pattern and you're teaching the wrong uh, things uh, so yeah i think what i what the way i kind of like to think about it and how i've taught it if i ever you know have somebody that i'm trying to explain how i want to set for the athletes is that I like to? I don't like to necessarily uh, force beta. I like to control space uh, as a setter. Yeah. So, like you know, a really you can think of a really, really uh, in non-incut side pull. As soon as you put it on the wall, and that's the only thing you put on the wall, you've basically divided the wall in half, and and really even like divided it from like outwardly too. 
as soon as it's boring yeah. cut, you like give you're giving them now degrees like away from the wall. So it's like anytime I put a hold on a wall, it's like I I allowed them this amount of space, and then you know as soon as then I put the the opposite facing one, it's like now I've allowed this side, and then this side, but nothing in between, and so. That's how kind of like whenever I teach it, I just think we're controlling space um, and you want to give them as little or as much as you as, as you want. But you have to be really mindful about that because it, it's exactly kind of what you're talking about. It's like it, whenever you make the hold more income, all of a sudden you gave them a lot of space and a lot of momentum that's available to them. That's what, what I meant at the beginning. You have to. Uh, the... You have to try to stay true uh, uh, to what you actually plan to teach, you know. And it's not that, that you can't make compromises, especially with moves like this. It's not something where, yeah, but it's uh, somehow okay. No, this these are really problems that have to be, be uh, you know, it has to be impossible. And this is why, of course, it's really annoying if the quality of the wall, you know, if if. Uh, if, if the wall has like uh, uh, rats that you can grab, you know, and and uh, uh, or if the quality is not very good and you have, you can uh, grip the panel or you can uh, uh, hold, the, uh, like you have a really nasty sloper, but then you still find something to uh, put your fingernails in, you know, uh, and uh, that might be the reality in your gym, you know, and the climber does it this way and succeeds. So you have a very uncomfortable argument with this uh, uh, athlete if you ask him or her to, to do it a different way. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, just, I mean, I, I don't know if this comes across, but I see it also uh, as uh, almost as character uh, um, building. It's not, in my mind, it's not only about being able to climb these things, but it's also apply it in different situations and also uh, uh, learning or exploring the right mindset for these uh, uh, these things. And what really struck me recently, just what, what you were explaining, Mio Nonaka does this uh, Japanese series. And this is all in Japanese. It's subtle titles, very Japanese. There are lots of plings and plongs and little uh, social media uh, adverts. But at one point, she takes a sloper like like this, like a, a hold like this, and then she she moves like like this, and just I mean I'm not even close in in doing this, you know, and just holding this, so you you're like okay, this is a world class climber, this demonstration that she gives, you know, and what you were just exp you know, like uh, how she manipulates, how she handles this thing in front of her is so competent. You know, and uh, she couldn't do this with, uh, I, I think this is really a sign of her coaches or, or the people she has been in touch with, uh, her setters like in, in B-Pump, Okikubo, they're very aware, you know, they, 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 uh, you can't cheat these things. Yeah, and I think that goes to, uh, like I, I, I might, might have written, written in here, here as well, it's like, like not, not beta. beta, and I, I, I guess, guess beta is a very, I don't, I think, I think the, the way, way that beta has been used recently, recently um, because beta, beta can, can mean, mean a whole lot of, of different, different things. things, but I think kind of what I meant by that is what you're saying in a way. Like uh, when I ask people, okay, how do you read this boulder problem, or like what is your plan? It's it's a lot of times it's like right hand here, then left hand here, and it's like a lot of information is missing from that because of exactly what you said. It, it, as you're thinking hold and hand position first, and you're not really thinking from the center of mass out and and you can tell for those athletes that it's like, you can't even really, sh you shouldn't really even be able to tell me. The only way you should tell me, it, be able to like, tell me what your plan is, is to show me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's also how I cue climbers on how to do movement. I don't really think, I, I don't know if almost every time people make fun of me, cause I don't really tell them like, Oh, you want to grab this and do this. It's, it's like, I really have to like yeah. show them in the space. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other, I think I wanted to ch touch on, on something else you said, said but maybe this, this list, list is not exhaustive. And I think the main thing that I wanted to get across with this is like Udo's and I's list is going to be, you know, I think part of the reason you and I get along is that a lot of times we share a lot of overlap in this stuff. But um, 
it's going to be different for every coach. And I think that's like the beauty of it. You might, this is going to be changing all the time, especially depending on what you're preparing the athlete for. So a lot of times, you know, maybe this isn't what they're going to get. And sometimes this is also rewarding things that I'll get into it in a little bit, but the, the second thing that I put in here, which is kind of what you, you were mentioning that resonated with you was, uh, maintains constant tension, which it's not really tension in the physical sense. It's more of just that the athlete is constantly being demanded to make a decision, like tension in almost like a, like a film, like a narrative sense. Um, like I don't want an athlete to be in a dihedral where they can just sit there for 30 seconds and contemplate what their next move should be. If they're in a dihedral and they want to sit there for 30 seconds, they need to be working the entire time. And, and ideally they should be, you know, it's like that as soon as they do a move and get into a position, a timer starts counting down five, four, yeah. three, two, one, where they have to try to do something, then they fall and then they have to come up with a plan on the ground. And that yeah. kind of adds into like the third thing that I put on here, here which, which is essentially, essentially like, like allows for many attempts, attempts which, which helps the athletes, athletes develop their process. process. So if they're used to this, if they're used to uh, remembering what they did, you know, and learning from this, but this is another thing you want to uh, uh, practice. You need to practice to learn from your mistakes. You yeah, know? exactly. The, uh, I, the, I guess the, the, we're talking about the reward situation and something that I don't really that like it would be frustrating for me, especially, let's say, at, at a national setting. If a slab allows you to be on a slab for like a minute and a half or something, then you're teaching the athlete that like a fall is catastrophic. Um, yeah. And they really only have one attempt or two attempts. Um, and that Absolutely. might be a lesson that you want. Absolutely. Maybe not the lesson that you want all the time. Absolutely, and especially in the in the youth setting. And now I, I really thought that the the USA climbing competitions back from a couple of years ago, before they you know with the many zones or the many bonuses, or I don't know how you used to call them, like that you had your ten hold, and then you went to so you basically you had uh, mini routes. And I have nothing particular against mini routes, you know. I, I, and there were some some really good ones in there. But uh, imagine uh, as a child, you know, or as a, or as a teenager, it, it's exactly that, what you just mentioned. Now, uh, uh, basically falling is a, a catastrophe. You know, uh, it can, uh, it's all over when you fall. And, and the question is, if, you, if this is what, what you want to teach a young athlete, if this is, uh, is, is should this be the message with a, a 14, even 16 years old, that, you know, you should be super careful and don't make a mistake. No, but because the very unglamorous uh, fact in cl of climbing uh, competitions is that there's a lot about avoiding mistakes. And this is really important, but this, in my mind, is a part of the maturing process. It, it, it almost comes automatically if the coach again sets this way you know like uh, it, uh, uh, it can be rewarded but it's not something uh, all uh, that should happen all the time you know so, so basically you're you're getting r risk adverse just from the setting you're you're being exposed to that yeah so this is this is closing later yeah i think you had yeah. a comment on our first video right where somebody asked okay well risk adversity or risk tolerance, I guess, would be like the the skill that you're trying to build, which I think is a skill that you want to build in athletes who are going to succeed at, at a high level. You you want them to be able to make decisions quickly and and go for risky uh, because it is rewarded. And somebody highlighted that in your comments, and they asked like, you know, what would be a good way to to build that? And I think this is an important way to build that. Is that again, tops are rewarding essentially, and especially results are sometimes can be rewarding. Um, and so you have to be mindful yeah. that these are always opportunities to reinforce good habits or, you know, punish like other habits. Yeah. So basically like the, the, uh, I, the a little difference between, uh, you and me, I think is that, uh, I, because I'm not in the business of setting as much as you are. So I look 
I actually look a lot of for, for body language and character traits, almost like really ba basic things. And this re risk aversity, I, I think it's almost easy to to um, uh, uh, to better this if you basically take anything away where, where the uh, athlete feels in control. <laughs> then and you do this basically every session now and, and even in like exercises and now there should be i i don't uh, see a whole lot of of uh, value in exercises that you know you can do uh, and i know from from uh, successful athletes that they're really and i think we talked about this you know that they really try to create this uncertainty you know that they're betting uh, you know, to, to put themselves under more pressure. But I think a, an exercise where you're concerned if you will be successful or not, or a boulder problem is much more valuable. You know? And so basically everything uh, that looks like uh, the athlete exerting control, take this away from them. And I think you made a nice progress towards uh, uh, less risk adverse uh, athletes. Yeah, I think, I think it, almost like you're, the challenge itself is intr intrinsically rewarding uh, in a way. Like uh, I think people seek, and, and that goes to what you were saying initially is like, let's say you're having a conversation with, with maybe you don't have that much control over the route setting in the environment at all. And you're going to start going back to the constraints that approach, you're going to start constraining the athlete and asking them. And a lot of times they'll say, well, why? I just did it the other way, like this works. And, and part of it is like for them, to you have to have a different mindset as you said well yeah you did it that way we're going to try it this way um because it you know maybe it highlights and rewards some of the things that you want to do which is kind of like what you were mentioning and I, maybe you can go a little bit deeper into that because for me again i have i've always been in situations i think where i had a lot of control over what was over the, on the wall but for you you're not necessarily route setting but you're having to communicate with our outsiders constantly to make sure that you're getting this for your athletes. So I think that would be a really important thing to yeah. highlight right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mean like uh, hands-on examples? Like Maybe not, but uh, one thing came into my mind, like one very basic thing every coach can do in every gym is doing speed bordering. You know, because uh, under time constraints, uh, our technique crumbles and uh, everybody's technique. You know, so you uh, again, you can do this. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know what appeared in your inner mind when I was talking about speed bordering. If it was like juggy uh, uh, campusing, no, it would be delicate slab climbing. Find even in the most basic or maybe old school gym, you will find a slab that is, uh, involves some balance. Uh, uh, you, you need some balance and put a time constraints on this. You know, put a time constraints on time constraint on balance tasks, and the boy, uh, everything is so open. You know, you, you, you will like athletes. We, uh, we saw athletes that uh, uh, could boulder uh, eight Cs, not being able to speed climb for, for three attempts, not being able to speed climb five Cs. So that would be even not on the V scale. That would be, uh, is it v, V1 v or V2? You know? So uh, you can easily take a, a V15 climber to, uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to falling if you ask uh, him or her to, to uh, do it fast, you know, and, uh, and apply pressure. You know, it's cool. Way. I think, so I really like that a lot. And I think that's a, because essentially you're forcing the indecisive, you're for, punishing the indecisiveness by a different way. And uh, it, it's like the brain has to keep up with like the amount of time that, but, I, I don't know if you can cut this in later because I don't have it prepped right now, but Orion at uh, maybe last Salt Lake finals, I think she had like 25 seconds or something like that to finish a slab. And yeah. I think that can really highlight what something like this does because yeah. For, yeah. for an athlete that is very indecisive, you will, I promise you, you will have an athlete like this that gets nowhere until the last 15 seconds of the boulder. And then all of a sudden it looks like they switch into a different 
mindset yeah. where they just everything yeah. is just decision followed by decision followed by decision and yeah. somehow they get to the top ross yeah. also had a good example of this in the salt, salt lake one uh, i think he did like 10 attempts on a boulder and then he had like 15 seconds to top yeah. it and um it's yeah. it's very interesting for sure what happens when the yeah. time all of a it's also a fantastic up. experience for the climber because i mean if everybody who ever tried this even on your red point project you know if you try to climb it as fast as possible you might be really pleasantly surprised how how easy this uh, this especially with something pumping pumpy uh, you know it's uh, if you try to speed climb it it, it feels like a, a different route you know and so that can be really good and maybe like Ross and even Orian they were surprised by how easy it was under this time constraint so there's a of course there's a nice lesson to learn too. Uh, uh, but but during practice, it's also very frustrating, you know, especially if you uh, uh, take something that needs a lot of precision, you know, and a lot of balance uh, situation that can't be, uh, that contradicts uh, uh, speed climbing a little bit because you have to find the position. I think that's the, the these are the most interesting uh, uh, things to work on and, and time constraints. And then you don't need to reset anything and uh, you you definitely you basically just by the time constraint uh, you have a different boulder problem yeah i think that's yeah. great yeah and yeah. go ahead you sound like you want to say yeah no but, but, uh, talk a little bit about the detail uh, is a lot um, if you look into what stresses people uh, it's uh, a lot is about consequences you know so you this is some uh, some pressure you can apply, you know, uh, and people react really uh, strongly to consequences. No, it, it doesn't have to be death. You know, it can be something really trivial, but you already have more uh, uh, pressure. It would be also good if you want to toughen up your up your athlete uh, a little bit. Um, and also these time constraints, but the time constraints, of course, are much more fun and have much more meaning if the uh, athletes are competing. You know, it's. I think that is something that's almost pointless if you do it by yourself. Uh, yeah, of course, if you're a very mature athlete, yes, you you did this uh, this very delicate sl uh, slap in 15 seconds. Uh, now try to do it in 13 seconds. But I, uh, the way we did this from uh, very early on, we had our strong boys. Uh, we gave them only one attempt. And, and then uh, the females had all, all the time in the world. And, and every single camp we had the girls beaten, uh, the uh, beat the time of somebody like Jan Hoyer. You know, it was just incredible uh, if you think about it. You know, that, uh, because they were so psyched, you know, they, were, uh, they had the opportunity and they could work it out. And uh, we saw a lot of engagement uh, too. I feel maybe yeah. we're straying too far from the road setting theme, but uh, uh, this goes back to what do you do as a coach without being able to have the most fantastic holds and uh, and uh, the best setters? Uh, I don't think so. I think I think you're we're right. Like you're right on it with it because I, I think uh, you know obviously if you're route setting, you have full control over the facility. That's like the ultimate. You know that would be the ideal situation. Um, but I think even things like this, I, I did something, we used to do this thing where I would set like uh, four kind of delicate slabs that weren't super hard or four or five back to back to back to back. And if you didn't do one, you'd have to start at the beginning. That's, and that would be consequences. Yeah. 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 And then you and and then really try annoying. to do it on a really yeah. short time. Yeah. And you just get yeah. really frustrated. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I think those yeah. are like means to a similar end. Uh, I think that that's uh, the other thing I kind of wanted to touch on because I think for you, similarly, you know, if I'm working by myself, then I kind of know what I want. But having a common language in route setting in terms of what what you want out of out of boulders is pretty, or what you want out of it is pretty important. And this kind of goes even to when you and the the crew at Mesa Rim when we started working together you know we hadn't really worked together in the past but we had to kind of develop an understanding and like a common language around okay this is what th that should be tested for the athletes and this is what it should look like and if you don't have 
full control, you have to be able to have that communication for it to, you know, for the head coach to be able to talk to the head route setter and say, this is what I'm looking for. And for that actually to show up on the wall. And so maybe if you could touch on that a little bit. Yeah, for me, actually, I'm, I'm a little uh, hesitant to, to, to wholeheartedly agree because I, I think like, for example, in the US, it's very common to talk about slow, fast, right? And, and I'm always a little bit, is it, for my taste, it's a little bit too black and white. You know, and we, we, in Germany, for example, we call these rhythm changes because it's a more basic, uh, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't talk about fast or slow. You know, I, I, I'm, well, I, as much as I would like to have a common terminology, I think it still uh, should allow for subtleness. You know, to, to, uh, to, because uh, sometimes I, I think many uh, com commentators in, in the World Cups, for example, or other events, they do a really good job, but they're they catering audience that is maybe not uh, like the, the, the border a little bit now, and that's, that's all cool. So the language is very much black and white, or, uh, or should I say they portray this as, okay, there's one ideal solution, and this is the wrong solution. Now they talk about faults or wrong or mistakes and, and stuff. And I think for, for working with like more mature athletes, uh, uh, you know, the, this terminology uh, needs, or, or even working among route setters, uh, should allow for more, more subtleness. No, then, then it's often the, the case, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think maybe not language from the term of like vocabulary, but even just how you explained it. I think that's really important for a person, for a coach to be able to articulate that, you know, hey, this is a, we want a, some boulders that, it, you know, have pacing change throughout the boulder and i think if you said that to somebody would they be able to know exactly what you're talking about not everybody necessarily right and so you'll you'll have to be able to explain what you mean and maybe examples or mime it out but i think like that kind of communication between a coach and a, and a route setter is really important because sometimes they just leave it completely off it, they just hand it off it's just like well next week there'll be new boulders on the wall well let's see what we get and we'll we'll practice on it no, no, yeah, the way we, we did this in, in Germany in, uh, was, I, I think, very successful in, in uh, 2012. Uh, the then most modern route setters and me, we, we had an agreement that, you know, that we, from then on we did all the camps, a little bit like we did the, uh, the camps with you, you know, or together, uh, that we, uh, we wouldn't just let the kids boulder but it would be all like it had motives like every everything had motives and very often these were character traits like patience or, or, or so you know and then the, the setters would set these these motives and would be very deliberate that uh, you know they, they were setting these so and uh, the, the communication was was really good but the first three camps were a total failure you know, because they were they were so concerned about the motive that the uh, uh, difficulty <laughs> uh, wasn't right, huh? and, and it was based on. Um, if I might share this, uh, in in 2012, I sat down. I, or actually, Robert Lux, who uh, runs a, a studio block in Funkstadt, that's one of the best uh, bordering gyms in Europe. Uh, uh, he was um, he's an international setter. And from our federation, we were asked to develop a route setting uh, curriculum. And it was clearly expected that the way they, but what they were expecting was like, okay, mental. You know, and basically like, and the, we were told many times, you know, we want to have it like, how, how you call it? Like what, what kids play with, like a, a Baukasten, uh, you know, you take one, building block from here and you put uh, it together with this building block. This was uh, and also a, a route setter could take this toy with all these building blocks and ca ca could set something really incredible by our uh, building block. You know, that, that was what they were asking for. And we spent one day and in the end of the day, we decided, no, we can't do it. You know? And it's also nonsensical. We don't want to do it. And what we came up with were, were three different, uh, almost really character traits, you know, about like uh, human beings being shy to risk something they invested in a lot. 
you know, like, uh, and I might put this in, in the stream, there's a really fantastic uh, Wikipedia page about uh, cognitive biases. And if you think about it, this is what root setting is based on, you know, like basically it takes these, uh, these human weaknesses, you know, like uh, uh, what we already mentioned, like decision fatigue or, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, these biases and puts them on the wall, you know, and this is what the German Alpine Club got from us. <laughs> and, uh, this was uh, how we interpreted our, our job. And, for, and we took this as a, uh, as a plan, uh, this curriculum as a plan for what we did with the German team 2012 till uh, 2014. You know? And in every camp, we had these, these motives uh, uh, that we had the athletes uh, work on and practice on. Yeah, it's hard to, it's like a reductionist approach to, to route setting is hard. You know, it's just, like you said, nonsensical in a way. And same thing with climbing. It's like if you start reducing it to, okay, heel hooks, toe hooks, it's, it's, it's a challenging way to approach it. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's cool. Uh, I, I like that. Just Another that approach really, I, I might have mentioned this before uh, last year but in the show, like if you're a coach, uh, try to get your hand on this, you know, because it really makes it's it's not the solution for all your uh, your question, but it's it's just uh, it's really interesting. It's it's uh, like like playing cards, you know, like and, and and you pick as uh, as many as you want, you know, and basically this would be building blocks. So it would be male. And then it would be, I don't know what I'm showing this, this would be the difficulty grade, and then it would be double jump, you know? And it, it's just, I, I mean, I never use them for setting, but it's just amusing and entertaining and very informative to just see what is there, you know? And it talks about the risk scale, risk uh, intensity, uh, uh, <laughs> complexity. what's the C? complexity yes and uh, um, it, it's definitely a mind opener but uh, that's that's safe to say so well uh, shall we take some examples still or you want to do, uh, talk about some examples yeah no? I, I mean I, I i pulled a video i one video i think this boulder is not necessarily i mean a, a reason why I, I chose this boulder and we're looking at the boulder on the right, although the boulder on the left is also a good example. So maybe uh, both of them at the same time. Uh, different but reasons, even just, yeah. yeah, the boulder on the right, I think, uh, kind of is uh, highlights something that would be good that people in the gym would be able to set. And there's a few qualities of it that are not super, um, they're subtle. Um, I think most people, if they're trying to read beta, they'd be like, well, you go right hand here, left hand here, right hand here. And that's like fairly clear like sequencing wise, but it's all the little details in between that, that are really important. And this is something that you'd be able to set in the gym and really like a few qualities of it. The holds aren't in cut. So they really restrict, you know, how much space is available to the athlete. Um, and yeah, and what I like, for example, this left black hold, she just went the, the uh, upper most uh, left hold you know and, and if you remember on l's list there is a, like you have to think in positions and this is a hold this left hold she's going uh, to uh, for right now no, not, not right now no <laughs> no this this needs a certain uh, shoulder and yeah basically all body p position to uh, to be used now this is I, I think what you had in mind and it can be easily like if you if you would have twisted it, uh, uh, turned it into a slightly this uh, direction, it would be a, a really boring uh, uh, situation, you know? And we were talking about like five to 10 degrees, right? That would make all the difference. This is a good example, because if you, if you basically don't stand up high enough into the side yeah. pull, you're you're off because the the direction which you have to load that hand is just not not right and so i think that's why position is important if you say oh, i'm just gonna i go left hand to this you're missing really the important part of the story uh and, and even let's say let's say this was set in the gym 
you know, really interesting for me immediately after looking at it is there's this foot chip at the very bottom on the start volume. I don't know if you can tell where her heel is at the beginning. Yeah, you this, can, yeah, right now. This, yeah. yeah, where her heel's at the beginning, where if, if I was coaching or if I was setting this for a camp um, after they did it, first question would be, okay, let's do it without it. Uh, just because even even if we look here as she's climbing through it, it affords her to stand really tall in it. If that foot wasn't there, she could not have this position. Her right foot would have to be quite a bit higher. And and uh, similarly, if we get to the top, um, there's a hold uh, on the volume where she crosses to. And that right here where she's crossing yeah. to where maybe the volume isn't good enough necessarily on its own, but if it was, it would also require quite a bit, like a different, the position would be a little different because even just that little ink cut allows them to pull out and it gives them a little bit more, more affordance as, as we talked about it before. And those are obviously things that during a competition, you have to have the right level. Otherwise you might not get any tops at all, especially in four minutes. But in a situation where we're coaching and this is a camp, like, you those those are really useful and and even on this one it's like well you just can't use it anymore because there's still plenty of volume to go around let's just see if you can do it and it oh, it gives the the athletes an opportunity to understand oh okay it really is about position and then you put them back on the foot chip and all of a sudden they realize wait wait this folder is way easier than it was before if i climb it exactly the same way as i did before without it because as soon as I can pull on something, my instinct is to use that new space that they gave me. But um, the positioning being like paramount is kind of like the important part of it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. This is uh, uh, this this process that Al just described to take a hold away. That's also a good starter, you know, like that you can do in, in most commercial gyms. I mean, there are some problems that don't land itself, but Elle pointed it out. You know, it just affords her to do something. Like if she, if she would be the tallest in your group, you know, this is Futaba Ito. And she is in your group and you have uh, all, uh, all other girls are shorter. And she is successful. You, you almost have to take it away from her. You know, because she, she learns nothing from, from doing this problem if, if you don't. You know, it's almost, uh, yeah, it reinforces uh, things she cannot do with better uh, and more deliberate route setting. Yeah. yeah, and I think that what she learns, a lesson that you can take from that, and this is, I think, the attempt where she actually finishes it. Uh, what she can learn from that, if you don't take it away, is that, Oh, okay. I can reach high to holds, and that's a good strategy. And if that's a strategy that's reinforced enough, then you know, any time that's presented, yeah, um, you're gonna take it. And as a as a route setter, that's a way to punish athletes by just dangling yeah. that in front of them. Oh, here's something that yeah. looks like. And see, we can even see here. Uh, this is a good example. So even just from, see, I didn't even plan this. This is this is all just. <laughs> you can see that she realized okay like it position first uh initially she had reached high but it wasn't you know it doesn't get her in the right position for the next move so she bumps her foot up to do it yeah. the next time and yeah. uh now it looks quite a bit easier so yeah yeah and this is like for me that's that's where the character building you know she learned to delay gratification you know, that's, uh, and that is a big part and I was just recently that they mentioned the marshmallow test, you know, and that I think octopus can, uh, can, uh, can delay gratification, I think better than three year old humans, you know, that sometimes it's in the media, but, uh, actually delaying gratification, it sounds very, uh, <laughs> so it's not, not very glamorous, but, uh, for, for long-term success in, in any feel that's really really important and in climbing whoa it's so big and it's 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 uh, of course it's not a trap a world-class climber would fall into but giving more exhaustion and being more tired and being under more pressure you know everybody uh, uh 
falls for it you know so uh, uh, if you talk about this dangling carrot you know if you like okay extend yourself you know you can almost deliberately put a handhold uh, a little chip for the feet you know so that somebody tall like adam can reach it you know and then he uh, uh, he's not in the right position like the, like she just was, like Potava just was. Uh, of course, Adam wouldn't fall for that. You know, that's uh, his class that is actually maybe the best climber in delaying gratification because this is one of the very strong points of Adam, how he sets himself up. You know, I, I think for Adam, doing the actual move is uh, basically that, that just happens. He's just so prepared, you know, he sets himself up so smartly for, for the, the moves. And why is he doing this? Because uh, he must have learned that sometimes. And also it's easy to imagine that Adam, in a, uh, without coaches not knowing what they're doing, would have never learned this. The yeah. same Adam, you know? And he maybe was a tall kid or uh, he wasn't a to super tall kid, but you're a very tall kid. You know, nobody really watches this. You know, you always can reach things from, from uh, decent footholds. You're not learning this. No? And this is a, a, a good message to you. You know, this is where you really, as a coach, where you have to watch it. You know, if, if uh, your climbers get away with uh, uh, strategies that are not really future proof. Yeah. And so maybe to, to bring it all a little bit, or I guess for me, and then maybe you can share what you think, but, um, the way that I approach route setting and, and its role in coaching is that it's a moving target and it's changing and you try to build an idea of what skills the athletes need in order to be successful at, at a high level. And, uh, route setting is a way of, building those skills up to a certain point. And as a coach, it's hard to delay gratification because some of those things might actually not win you competitions immediately right now, but they will set the athlete for success later. And I, to offer kind of like a, a bad example, but I, this one is, is one I share all the time. Imagine you had a really, really tall, you know, 12 year old on your youth basketball team. If you wanted to win games, like a viable strategy might be put them under the hoop let's not play defense, throw it to him every time and, and you'll win. But he that person is not learning. Yeah. yeah. But that person yeah. is not going to learn how to, yeah. how to play basketball. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. And from my, from my perspective, that's the, 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 the same is true. I, I already mentioned this for the, uh, distal to proximal way of moving, you know, which is totally makes totally sense. If you're uh, climbing on loose rock, I know where this is coming from. But for modern climbing, and I totally include uh, lead climbing, you know, if you see all the successful lead climbers, they uh, uh, move uh, with their hip, you know, and only when they're really stressed, only when it gets really close to falling off, then they resort to the, it's much easier for the brain too, you know, and uh, to, because we're so aware, the, the, our hands are so well represented in our brain that our first impulse is to pull on things. But again, you know, that, that that might be not the best solution. And this is really something what Al just said with, with the size, you know, that uh, and this the, the way of moving. This is what you want to watch as a coach. And this is what you can change or, or steer into the right position if you're somehow deliberate with your your setting. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I think we'll probably uh, it's such an interesting conversation in general that I, I think it's probably one we'll revisit. Um, but thank you, Uda, for chatting today. Sorry, I think we took more than two weeks in between, so hopefully maybe we'll squeeze one in a little bit earlier next time. But thank you for joining Plenty us. Plenty to talk about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank time. you. Leave yeah. comments.